Welcome to this Positive Psychology News webinar. Our guest today is Dr. George Valiant. George is a professor of psychiatry at Harvard Medical School and at the Department of Psychiatry at Mass General Hospital. George has spent 35 years doing something that you and I have likely never done anything like. He was the director of the Study of Adult Development at Harvard. What does this mean? For over 70 years, 824 men and women were followed over the course of their career. Almost 70 years, that's a long time to be following someone's life. That study led to a lot of our understanding about adult development. And we'll talk about that. We'll talk about adult development, about love, about the difference between joy and happiness. We're welcoming George to this call. And as one of the numerous uh, accolades that George has received, we want to share with you that he's most recently received the Distinguished Service Award from the American Psychiatric Association. We're extremely glad to have George with us. George, hello. Hello, Sonia. Hello, everybody else. George, in the next hour, what would you most like people to know after our talk today? Uh, I'd like them to know that um, due to the maturation of the brain, life gets better well into 70 or 80 uh, if you don't have a few obnoxious illnesses like alcoholism, major depression, and Alzheimer's. And when you say life gets better, what do you mean? Well, I mean that you're less depressed, you're more, you're more um, tolerant. tolerant. Um, um, your, your style of adaptation tends to be more altruistic, um, like humor and altruism rather than narcissistic, like being paranoid or hypochondriacal. And so you're saying that people change from these worse ways of being to these better ways of being as they grow up. And, and they, that happens just thanks to the fact that our brains remain embryologically developing uh, into age 60 or more, which allows us to have greater uh, control over uh, impulses and sort of the reptilian part of our brains. I think another part of that conclusion is that you're saying that older people can be more fun to hang out with. That's tough because kids are an awful lot of fun. <laughs> I'm not sure. Um, fun and maturity uh, don't go hand in hand. They should. I've, I've never thought of that before, but uh, I, I think fun is uh, with the brakes off. Uh huh. Uh huh. And maturity is um, driving at the speed limit. <laughs> <laughs> right. Right. Next question. If you could, we do a few of these quick questions at the beginning before we do a deep dive into your work. If you could snap your fingers and almost any, everyone in the world were to do one thing, what would that one thing be? You, that made me really think when you uh, asked it in advance, but it would be the golden rule. Do unto others as you'd have others do unto you. Ah, uh, so this might be a separate discussion between you and I on the golden rule. Okay, okay. And, and, and different quirks of it. What? You have a different version? I have read of a different version recently in a series of books that, that you know of that my dad writes, and, and there are some issues with the golden rule. I'll post a link in the, in the context of this video, but just... Uh, whom does the golden rule help, and is it really golden? <laughs> okay. That's, I, 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 I would like to meet your dad. I'm afraid we'd argue. <laughs> Maybe one of the future videos will be on ethics between George Valiant and Zach Wyman. <laughs> Terrific. I love it. 
George, what did you want to be when you were growing up? I wanted to be an astrophysicist because I was uh, in interested in uh, the origin of the universe. And in a sense, I did that in much more humanistic uh, forms as I never would have gotten through Caltech that I could <laughs> read uh, novels. <laughs> So, what is the most important thing in the world? Love. And I'm going to pause on that because we're going to have a whole discussion just on that in the article that you wrote for us for CPN. Okay, wonderful. And then, George, sometimes we as people, we think about things that we do that aren't as easy or natural to other people or where we may have a greater effect or impact. And I kind of think of that as the one thing that we can do. So what is something that only you can do? Well, I'm sure it's not only me, but the uh, ability, the reason that there's not very many longitudinal studies is people have trouble staying focused on what is going to be the next chapter, what's going to be in tomorrow's newspaper. And they sort of lose track or they uh, don't pay attention to the fact that you've got to raise money in order to um, keep a longitudinal study going. And I think that my, um, really from internship on, I've been absolutely fascinated in long-term follow-up. And it, it, it's the grant study has gotten the most attention, but I've been interested in uh, just going through the pages in a hospital chart and seeing that things change. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, you've studied people in depth in their range of their life. For our uh, viewers who may not be as familiar with the with a longitudinal study or following people from a young age, how does that work? How does that process work? How does the process of development or how it is the process of uh, keeping people sending their questionnaires back? Yeah, studying people over time. Well, it works the same way it does to watch a kitten turn into a cat. As Ogden Nash said, the trouble with a kitten is that it grows up and becomes a cat. And, and so that's the development. So it's really, the way you describe it in your books, it's that certain students or certain groups were measured at an initial point with a, a range of diagnostic metrics and then followed up over years with surveys. Is, is that the basic process? Yes. And, yeah. but, uh, the, the surveys weren't as important as when they talked. I mean, it's, it's like a blue book exam tells you much more about what a person knows and thinks than a multiple choice exam. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The surveys, and that's it is the, the tales that go on. When you would visit these people at their homes and speak to them. Yeah. And how much time would go by between your different visits to the same person? Uh, about, I, I, I interviewed everybody um, twice at midlife and at retirement. And they were interviewed also when they were children and when they were um, young married by um, other investigators. The, mm -hmm. uh, the young married were <laughs> done by a woman whose uh, specialty was studying Eskimos and they figured that that was the best way to have study wasps. <laughs> that, that's a very philosophical observation. <laughs> okay. <laughs>
So George, as you as we're just about to start to dive deep, I, I'd love to know some of your summary observations as you've studied people in their 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s. What's what's the funniest thing people do? I'd almost this isn't um, the only uh, answer, and it's shooting from the hip, but it's that they um, forget the past and rework it. So that the stories that they tell later in life are different from what actually happens. They rewrite history. And, and we all do this subconsciously, unconsciously. Well, I, I expect we also sometimes uh, tell conscious untruths. So that's the funniest thing people do. Intriguing, huh? Okay, let me ask you a few more. What's the most surprising people thing that people do? What comes to mind is to get well, and, and I'm not sure that's the most, <laughs> if you think of really the, one of the most remarkable things about bodies as well as personalities is that they heal. I mean, if you ever think of when you have a bad cut and then it manages to grow over and, uh, it's, it's like you never had it. And, and that process of, um, it, I mean, immortality is too strong a word, but this process of, 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 of healing. And, and you only can study healing over, over time. And, and the good news is that it's perfectly true that diseases that kill you uh, get worse with time. But in general, um, the flu or broken legs or um, sh short fuse gets better. So the most surprising thing you've observed is actually something you've observed psychologically, but that just about parallels the physical healing process. Yes. Yeah. I, th I think so. Yeah. I hadn't put it in that terms before. It, the way you describe it, it, it seems powerful. It seems like almost whether a person wants to heal or not, some healing happens over time. Yes, you don't have any choice. <laughs> what do you mean? <laughs> well, when you cut yourself, I mean, this is partly a function of being my age, is that you... Uh, bruise yourself and it bleeds and it takes a while to heal uh, and uh, you, you can't make it heal. You just have to be patient and magically uh, the skin grows over and the scab goes away mm -hmm. and uh, it's the uh, same with recovering from um, addiction or um, probably also a um, broken heart. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Time then, things, which is a little bit facile, but uh, it's, it, we, we are born, we're, we're, we're organized to heal. And I've never thought of that before, but you're a good interviewer. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's a deep thought that we're organized to heal. And to give one more of these kinds of things, you've talked about the funniest things, funniest thing people do, the most surprising. And then what about what is the most psychologically healthy thing that people do?
what I associate to immediately is to hug or cuddle. And this is based on the physiological fact that we have a sympathetic nervous system, which helps us to uh, fight, flee, or there's two other F words that get in there. Uh, and uh, then there's the parasympathetic nervous system, which lets us cool down, our hearts stop beating fast. Um, we aren't interested in um, fleeing and we have the general feeling that we have when we cuddle a kitten. I mean, it's, it's, it's just suddenly all good, but it includes altruism, forgiveness, gratitude, um, love. So, isn't that so fascinating? I've just asked you what the most psychologically healthy thing is that people do, and your answer is, is the physical response. The brain that's connected to the... <laughs> <laughs> that, so, connect, connected closely to the body. Uh-huh. So you're saying that physical response, it strikes off or sets off the most psychologically healthy things we can be doing. Well, I think it psychologically sets off the physically most. I mean, the impulse to suddenly hug people is you have the impulse to hug them first and then you do it. So you're saying the most psychologically healthy is just is being responsive to impulses like this. Being responsive to positive emotions, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, George, we run an interactive shop here. We, we, we don't do only above the head. So for our viewers watching now or in the future in recording, please do, as Elaine O'Brien often suggests that we do, just give yourself a hug. George, you do. I know this is funny, but when we talk about hugs or cuddling, we are an interactive place and we just do it. Okay. So how did that feel? <laughs> <laughs> well, it's more fun talking to you, Sandy. <laughs> You've always made me feel hugged. Thank you. When I, uh, just for the audience, when I first met uh, George, he was a, a professor of ours at the Masters of Applied Positive Psychology program at UPenn. And I went up to him and said, so George, I've really enjoyed this book. So many stories about, uh, just stories, really. There, it, it felt like reading a lot of stories. Could you tell me, in the context of this book, what is the most important thing that people should do as they age? Do you remember your answer? You yes. I did. You're right. That's why, that's why it was such a touche. I said, George, what are the three most important things that people should do as they age to age well? And you said? Play, play, play. Very related to our, uh, to our interactive hugging here on our. <laughs> so let's, let's switch gears a little bit and go deep into the study of adult development before we open it up to questions in about 20 minutes. So please feel free, uh, everybody who's on our call, to start typing in questions. We will get to them very soon. George, what was the situation before you started doing your work? What were the, the beliefs in the world that were standard before you started your work? Uh, the big one was that folks don't change. Once a little conservative, always a little conservative. Uh, from Gilbert and Sullivan. Uh, and William James said, after 30, the character is set in plaster. And, and that that's was, pretty firm. That's pretty that firm. Was, that's it. After 30, forget it. And, and there was, you know, there were a lot of smart people doing studies uh, and saying folks don't change. And indeed, my mentor that sort of passed the study on to me, uh, he, poor man, um, only got to play with the study for 15 or 20 years and hadn't seen uh, 
as much change as you do if you let them grow for 50 years. And, and his motto was folks don't change. I, I never, I hadn't remembered that from your uh, work. I hadn't remembered that uh, the person who handed it over to you had thought folks don't change. Well, that's one of the interesting things about the um, study. And, and you asked me what you should suggest people read. And I said, triumphs of experience because it uh, records the different views that the different people running the study had and the evolution of um, people over time. And a lovely um, example of this, if people want a really good read, is the Hope Circuit by Marty Seligman, in which he describes his own growth and development. Mm -hmm. Hi. Let, let's share, let's do a little screenshot of some of the books that are, that George has written. So as you see, if we go to Amazon and just look for George's page, we have the triumphs of experience that he spoke about. We have Aging Well, a book that I've loved so much. Lots of stories in it. Spiritual Evolution, big fan. He writes about the difference between puppies and snakes. The Wisdom of the Ego, a deep book, a little bit technical and wonderful. Ego a mechanism of defense. He studied alcoholism and Alcoholics Anonymous a lot, the natural history of alcohol, alcoholism revisited, Adaptation to Life, fabulous book. So just so many books. And this is the one he most recommends, Triumphs of Experience for Understanding the Content of the Work that he did. These are George's books, lots and lots and lots. Enjoy. Yeah, so, so the prevailing belief was that people don't change. And uh, now, had you always thought that those beliefs were wrong, or had you also believed that at the time before you started studying the study of adult development? Uh, I, I guess the, the, the short answer is I, I don't know if I'd ever, I mean, it, it wasn't an article of faith for me, either that they changed or not uh, being trained as a psychoanalyst the uh, fervent belief of psychoanalysts is that people change and it's all because of the uh, analyst and uh, I'd been impressed at a number of people I've known who'd been analyzed and it hadn't seemed to change much so I although I was trained in it uh, I was um, skeptical and it was the change in the men themselves to just watch uh, a 20 year old train wreck turn into a uh, mature kind and happy man who actually the process I mean he it's it's a good thing to have a happy childhood. If you want to pick uh, good platoon officers, uh, you pick people with good childhoods. But um, this guy had a lousy thing. Uh, family of origin and spent his life recreating uh, a family around him, I mean, literally out of uh, whole cloth. Uh, and uh, I, I don't think everybody um, does that. So he sort of was a prime exa example of a caterpillar most clearly turning into a butterfly. So am I understanding you right, that if people self-reflect on their own lives, most people will see this same progression that you describe in your books of going from worst ways of handling situations to more mature ways of handling situations. Is that in most of our lives? 
I don't think it's necessarily uh, conscious that the ways we defend ourselves, I mean, whether uh, my, I mean, Beethoven was um, bad tempered, grumpy, deaf, and nobody loved him. And he sat down and wrote the Ninth Symphony. And uh, there are other people that are just born paranoid. I mean, it's, it's risky to use political figures, but... Um, let's not, let's not, let's not. <laughs> let's not. <laughs> I'll stay with Nixon. Uh, it's just that he wondered why he couldn't be more outgoing and lovable uh, and less paranoid and suspicious. You know, one example that you use throughout the books is Tolstoy. And of course, I'm interested in that because I'm from Russia. What is it that has intrigued you about Tolstoy's life? Oh, wow. Uh, I mean, the, it was watching his life uh, develop that one uh, taught the, the importance of when you didn't have love um, when you were young, that you could uh, find it. And uh, I, um, again, found what I wanted to uh, in that his marriage was less good than I thought it was uh, in uh, initially uh, reading the book. But um, Tolstoy sort of clearly went from being a delinquent adolescent to a loving uh, husband only once he gave his poor wife 13 children <laughs> she i think became less loving back and uh, then in in old age uh he was enormously um uh, generative towards the whole world so that i mean his scope that it was tolstoy who was the model to gandhi and mandela and that's not bad for a russian <laughs> i'll keep that in mind <laughs> um, Yes, so you described Beethoven, you described Tolstoy, you described this one person in your study who went from having a, a terrible adolescence to just kind of growing through that and taking some actions also to grow out of that, right? Yes. Yeah. I want to share the screen because we mentioned this book. This is um, a, a, a dear friend of George's and mine, uh, Marty Seligman, and this is his autobiography, The Hope Circuit, which... Uh, is a new book this year, which George, you are suggesting as an example of an individual, an individual's own study of his own adult development. I, I, and I don't think he uh, is reflective of it. I mean, I don't think he's, uh, he's more interested in the development of psychology, but I, <laughs> having known him, 30 years and not doing very well with um, big picture things. Uh, I'm more interested in Marty's growth and development. I understand. So you believe he accidentally wrote a case study of himself for the adult development literature as he was writing this book? Yes. Got it. <laughs> Got it. Okay. You and I only have um, uh, just under 10 minutes left of these set of questions, and then we're bringing in the, the viewers who already have about five or six in queue. So let me summarize the situation again. It sounds like you're saying the situation before was that pe before you did this work was that people didn't believe, like you said, William James, what, whoever you are at 30 is who you will be for the rest of your life. Yeah? Yes. And as you started working on this, you saw the changes that people could make, especially from past bad experiences and life situations and hardships to a life of, like you say, altruism and humor. And, and Is that right? The 
first key because, I mean, Erickson talked about it from an armchair, but a man named Henri Troyat wrote a, a biography of Tolstoy uh, that reads like a novel, but it's all stuff that Tolstoy uh, wrote. And uh, as a model of um, development, and I'm not sure that Tolstoy himself appreciated it, but Triot was a very good uh, biographer and novelist. And uh, so that would be a, a, a place where it wasn't Tolstoy reflecting. And I, I, I don't know that everybody can reflect very well on their own growth and development. I think like wound dealing, it just happens. That's a, so I, I've read your work previously and today I'm getting a different sense of, yes, there's, there are proactive things you can take, you, proactive measures you can take. Like you've previously, I, like I've previously understood your work, but today I'm really getting a sense of just be there and you're going to <laughs> turn into a butterfly. <laughs> Wait a minute, you're saying just say that again. I'm, I'm getting a sense from what you're saying today that regardless of what we push or pull or try to do, as long as we kind of keep going year over year, eventually we become more pleasant human beings to ourselves and to others. Um, it's true that's what I've said, that when I first met Marty, uh, he realized that my thought that mature defenses were better than immature defenses. And uh, he said, well, how do you mature your defenses? How do you get your defenses to mature? And I said, it's, it's just the grace of God. Uh, and, uh, but you know, the difference between psychiatrists and psychologists is psychologists are interested in education. And Marty has spent his life uh, teaching people how to uh, respond more maturely than immaturely and uh, is uh, the, uh, no dear. Tyam, you, can you pull up his whole name? Tayab. Uh, Tayab? Yeah. Um, Rashad, of course I can pull up Tayab's name. Yeah, one second. Yeah. Uh, uh, in fact, one of our listeners definitely will as well. Um, yeah, he, I thought, has written the best Rashid. Book. Tayab Rashid. Okay. And he is in sort of describing how you do this here, positive psychology, has, I think, written the best book on positive psychology ever. Written. The positive psychotherapy book. Yes. Okay, I'll share that with the with the viewers as well. This is the positive psychotherapy book by Tyab that George is referring to. Positive psychotherapy. Cool. Okay. Okay. I, so you and Marty a little bit disagree because you say here's what I am observing, and Marty says, "But how do we teach people to do that?" No. Uh, is that no. right? Yeah. I mean, I was now. Stay content just to marvel at the universe rather than figuring I had to do anything. You know, sometimes this, this uh, is a little bit of a digression, but sometimes I, I wonder about some of the items that I've read in your book, and it, it seems like you're playing with the universe and you're wondering. I'll, I'll read a couple of them. Like you just said about the difference between psychologists and psychiatrists. At one point you write, if poets are blind to love, Psychologists are struck dumb. Ah. And what did you mean by that? George, what did you mean by that? No, I, 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 I haven't fallen down a hole. Uh, I'm, I'm not. You were, you were writing about how psych that just the literature, psychologists are don't study love as much as you would have liked them to. 
Yes, and poets do. So I, I'm, 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 I, 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 it's true that psychologists are struck dumb, but I'm not sure that poets are blind. <laughs> So I, okay. I just don't want you to, to diss poets. Okay, okay got it. <laughs> got it. Uh, another thing you write is in describing, uh, it, when you describe how Sigmund Freud himself did not experience joy, you write, what an irony it is that in, jo in German, Freude means joy. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I promised uh, you and me and the readers that I would get to this topic, which is love. And I'm going to share the screen uh, as we're speaking. Uh, about, I don't remember, maybe five, six, maybe a number of years ago, the Atlantic did a huge piece on your work, including a video interview with you, right? Mm -hmm. And after that, we at Positive Psychology News asked you to, uh, to write a little more on some of the conclusions that you had shared there. And so this is an article of yours on uh, PPN. Yes, I stand by my words. Happiness equals love, full stop. And what I was struck by in this article is that you say, look, here's the, here's the research project. And I made two rash generalizations. I'm going to highlight it for, for our viewers. The only thing that matters in life are your relationships to other people. And happiness equals love, full stop. And then you go into the study and you talk about how in 38, the study sort of got its its population of people and started studying them over time and over time. And you, and you talk about what the study expected to find, all of these things that we've talked about, it, that it expected to find, okay, so your social standing or your IQ, that's what's going to really move you forward. Mm -hmm. And then can you speak about what you actually did find in the study? Do you want me to Say it? Yes. Oh, I don't mean read it. I just mean what, what, what was your conclusion about love that superseded your hypothesized conclusion? Um. When I was called on it, I had to go back to the data to get sort of crucial examples that showed that it was important. And the um, one that has stuck in my mind the most is um, that they were interested because it was started during World War II in what constituted leadership. And none of the things that they thought, like social class and intelligence and the playing fields of Eton, had anything to do with whether you got promoted in the military. But if you had a happy childhood, uh, they did. And uh, one of the heroes of positive psychology, Chris Peterson, uh, said, well, it's clear that the good platoon leader loves his men. And that, you know, it obviously helped if someone loved you first. So that, uh, and I suspect that even my hero who, uh, Camille, uh, who was a hypochondriac who became um, a mature man and kind of grew himself, but I suspect he would not have been a good um, platoon leader, although his um, children said he was a wonderful dad, but I think the education went the other way. I think they taught him how, and, and he had the ability to learn. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Okay, we are opening it up to the audience. So here is a, uh, a question. What does it mean 
when you said that in one's 60s, the brain stops being embryologically developing? Well, it's not what, I mean, most people think the brain stops embryologically developing by 20. And so that taking it up to 60 uh, and saying there's evidence for it uh, is a leap forward. And obviously, uh, everything else in our body goes south after 20. And so that <laughs> can keep going till 60. I think uh, it, it's done enough. And to have it go on developing, uh, there's a lot of other things that aren't going so well up to that time. And uh, so that it's quite a triumph when your muscles and your memory and all the good things that get us through the day or your sexuality uh, is going south um, for your brain to keep on uh, learning how to master the negative emotions. I mean, it's metaphorically as well as anatomically what goes on in the amygdala and what goes on in the hypothalamus feeding, fighting, running away and uh, sending valentines, uh, all of which can lead to trouble. Uh, so you're saying to, to this uh, viewer that uh, you're choosing 60 not a, as a hard and fast, but as a more metaphorical extension. But, uh, there's people have shown anatomical films that the uh, control that the forebrain has over the limbic, over our animal appetites, uh, becomes stronger. You, you tame, uh, you become tamer, better behaved, follow the rules. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, here's uh, a, another participant. They, they are asking, if George, if you could wave a magic wand, which could change one thing in the participants that would have helped them have a more fulfilling li life when they were young, what would that have been? Oh, well, that brings up my favorite bumper sticker, which is happiness is drive reduction. In other words, what's wrong with positive psychology is it's all about um, that when we eat a Big Mac or empty our bladders, we are happy. Uh, but joy is connection. There's a difference between drive reduction and connection. And it's, it's connection that is the um, gift that if I could give or even have more of it myself uh, would be my first choice. It oh. also sounds like you're making... What? It sounds like you're making a distinction that happiness is drive reduction, so it's individual, and joy is community. No, it's, it's just the way the... Um, brain is um, wired. Uh, it isn't, because uh, cuddling is selfish. It's just, it's shared and you have a connection with someone else. Um, King Midas, uh, everything he touched turned to gold, which was um, make anybody happy. But it doesn't, it didn't lead to a good connection with his daughter. <laughs> Out, <laughs> uh, George. One of our readers, at, viewers, asked specifically about joy and happiness. They write: Is there a difference between unhappiness and joylessness? Uh, 
They actually follow up with a, sub a second question, or are the lower ends of both scales subsumed in a generalized lack of emotion and hedonia? No, uh, I mean, my <laughs> uh, snappy retort is, is it uh, worse to be constipated or lonely? Say more. <laughs> Well, when you got to go, you got to go. That's drive reduction. Loneliness is lack of connection. And, and we've all, so that it would be, um, is what's missing in your life is a person or is what's missing in your life a uh, creme brulee? I have to say we've covered all of nature from butterflies to constipation. We're just, we're getting a whole, whole <laughs> thorough walk through the woods. <laughs> the next question is, how do we actually heal psychologically? What's the neurological process and what aids it? Oh, uh, that's, that's too, um, profound for me to um, answer on the fly. It's the right question. And just as I've said, wound healing and getting over addiction as in recovering in AA from alcoholism or getting happy with um, separated from major depression by um, Prozac. Um, now I've gotten off the... Yeah, they just ask about the neurological process. If, when we actually heal psychologically, what's the, the neurological process and what can aid that process? Yeah. Uh, I mean, that's a hard enough question so that I um, positive psychology, the methods that they've developed to help PTSD to anything that interrupts recurrent obsessions and um, fears is is healing and and so that on a being hugged in a safe place which is more i mean the problem with positive psychology is it's too uh, mechanical and uh, the um, I, I, I can't uh, riff on it but just what was missing from my um, depiction of, of the grand study was that I didn't know enough about attachment theory and the Bowlby's idea about um, you, 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 you separate um, child from the mother and you see what happens and uh, how you would go about treating attachment disorders would, would get it. To I mean, it's, it's, it's the essence of um, successful psychotherapy and um, we're or I'm not and Freud wasn't good enough at it uh, so that Tyab and uh, a man named Bessel van der Kolk uh, the body keeps the score uh, have um, 
very excitingly um, talked about how to do this. You speak about attachment uh, theory, and that relates may relate to the next question. The question is, I would like to ask George if he found in his Harvard study any indication of participants displaying more well-being if they had been parents versus non-parents. Um, I mean, my, my, having had five children, um, there's, um, rude book about parenting called, and the trouble is it's, uh, Maybe you come to your mind. Uh, it's 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 something about all, oh yes, all joy but no fun. And uh, so to say that uh, people who have children are uh, happier or do better uh, have to come up against uh, the truism of that a child is uh, all joy but no fun. And, and what about in the study? What, was there more well-being for parents or non-parents or was that not evident? Well, it's which came first, the chicken or the egg. The fact that you chose to go through life without a lasting connection uh, would be um, hard. Uh, and what comes to mind is in, in the 1940s among uh, wasps, uh, there wasn't much about um, homosexuality, but the one really stable um, homosexual relationship that was very much a lifelong marriage uh, was their lives were just as satisfying satisfied as people that had had a bunch of kids. But, cool, man. And, and it's, it's a, I mean, the thing, the good thing about uh, children having been rude about them uh, is, is, is that they do teach you how to love. I mean, if you hadn't done it before, uh, a child can teach a parent about loving that in, in a way that you can't get from a pussycat or a coin collection. As we come near the end of our session, we usually have about two or three final questions. And while I'm asking you those questions, we ask the viewers to please type in, you can type into the question box or into the chat section, what are you taking away from the session? And I'll read those off. So what are you taking away from what we've talked about here today for the past um, almost hour? Uh, any thoughts, anything that you want to say thanks to George or, uh, I expect, or this especially made an impact? Go ahead, type into our chat box or into our question box. Uh, one person has already typed, I love the implication that parents should take the long view about their children's development. <laughs> a 30-year-old 30, a 30 has a lot of life left to go. <laughs> here you are. Um, uh, so we have this additional question uh, before we do our la last question. At 73, a, a viewer says, at 73 years old, on a bit of a serious note, I would like to know what is the most useful thing to do with, my, with oneself and second and third. <laughs> 
they're going against your play, play, play. But really, from a point of view, it sounds like of taking action at age 73. I'm not sure. Instead of playing, taking action? It, it, that's what the, how the question reads to me. What kinds of actions can I take first or second or third if I am 73? Oh, I'd, I'd, I'd say create, create, create. Create? What do you mean by that? Create what? What, create what kinds of things? Uh, putting something in the world that was not there before. Mm -hmm. So that, I mean, and this is, uh, I'm uh, 83, my wife is 66, and she's still working actively as a psychiatrist, helping very ill uh, Patients and I'm reading uh, War and Peace, which I'd never had the time or patience to read before. And uh, clearly, what my wife is doing is more creative, and she gets a little impatient with my uh, being a happy uh, 84 year old, but <laughs> not a very uh, creative one. <laughs> this <is> <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm going to read you two or three columns and ask our last question. What people are taking away, one person says that we are wired to heal. He loves it and thanks, George. Another person is saying profound thoughtfulness is what they're taking away. A third person is saying uh, thank you and they're taking away that love in all capital letters. Love is the answer of you. They say of you I've always held and love having reaffirmed by an esteemed expert. And they send us a heart sign through the through the chat. That's very sweet. And the, the final comment uh, coming in is thank you, George. It's always a pleasure listening to you. I'm taking from this from this talk the importance of cuddling and hugging. And right. the person says. I think of my widow 70 year old mother and how she doesn't get hugged often. So I will go today and hug her. Oh, good. <laughs> uh -huh, uh -huh. <laughs> and uh, uh, one person just typed in that we aid our healing by interrupting, interrupting obsessive thoughts. That, <laughs> and that, oh boy, this is a, uh, it turns out this is an alliteration connection beats, Relieving constipation. <laughs> George, you know, when we end a session, I often ask, what is the one takeaway you want us to think? But I'm going to ask you a different question. George, as we are ending now, how do you want us to feel? Oh, you clever. Because my first response was happy, and clearly that's not right. I would like you to feel loving and appreciative of cuddling. Wonderful last word. Thank you so much, George. Thank you. I mean, this has is, been as valuable to me as I'm sure it is to any of the listeners. And, and thank you for your thoughtfulness in putting this all. You see, this is what the difference between what Senya is doing and what I'm doing is that I'm sitting around taking in reading and Senya's out there setting up this complicated webinar and uh, sharing it with lots of people. Just to let the audience know as we end, George and I had a fun time uh, with Mandy uh, preparing and trying and practicing and getting the audio and video right. So but I think what we did is play, play, play towards the goal of create, create, create. Yes, sir. Thank you very Thank you. warmly. Thank you so much. Thank you. All the best to everyone.